So I'm going to talk about MIST lifts, and uh, you know, as, as you've heard from these previous talks, I'm going to go over just a little bit, just to let everybody know in, in advance. Um, this is this is a difficult one. When I saw this on on the agenda, I was like, MIST lift versus mid lift, like it's kind of the same thing, you know. Um, so as an overview, I'm going to talk about the history of T lift and uh, MIST lift technique, then the future of MIST lifts. Let's let's show of hands. How many surgeons here actually do T lifts? Okay, how many, how many surgeons do MIST lifts? Okay, about the same number. How many people do mid lifts? Small number, okay. So here are my disclosures. The, the most, the most um, appropriate one is, is Amplify Surgical is a portfolio company of IntuitiveX, which is our incubator. And um, Am Amplify Surgical, and I'm gonna talk about this, has a new, very novel, dual expanding, expandable titanium cage. So what the heck is a midlift? <laughs> so like when you when you start typing midlift, what comes up is midlife crisis. <laughs> I seriously couldn't even find like what is a midlift, you know what I'm you know what I'm saying? Like so unless you do it, and I know what it is, I don't do it, but I and some people do it, but it's like so you 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 start typing midlift and it prompts out midlife crisis and I think that Peter is, is probably going through a midlife crisis himself. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. He's a very accomplished surgeon from Yale. But the T-Lift's been around for a long time. And the reason why it's been around for a long time is because it works, right? It was first published in 1944, this, this technique, described as a posterior lumbar inner body fusion. And initially, they used laminectomy, laminectomy bone to kind of just pack the space. But it wasn't until 1953 when Do Dr. Cloward really described, described this impacted iliac crest bone graft, you know? So he really revolutionized the way of stability by using bone. So he took iliac crest bone graft and he p impacted it into the, into the space. But modern T-lift was really popularized by Jurgen Harms. You know, Professor Harms came, came to the hospital for special surgery about twice, twice per year. So I actually had the, the, the honor of actually um, scrubbing in on cases with him. He's an unbelievable surgeon. But he popularized this novel bone graft within a titanium cage. And he would put it bilaterally, you know? So they were almost like, it was almost like a pliff type of approach through a T-lift, but he would put bilateral cages in, you know, to improve the stability. So I'm gonna really just highlight the, the advantages of a minimally invasive T-lift approach with this case. So this is a 64-year-old morbidly obese female. She presents with a one-year history of half low back pain and half right-sided leg pain, about seven out of 10 on both. She's attempted all the you know, non-surgical options, failed. She had a right L5-S1 transframinal with good pain relief, and her ODI was 56. So she was relatively disabled from this. On physical examination, she was 5 feet 8 and 300 pounds. So her BMI was 44.3. So morbid obesity is considered to be any, anywhere in between 40 and 44.9. So there's this another classification called super obese. And she was at that, she was at actually at that mark where she's almost super obese, and that's greater than 45. She had some weakness in her great toe extensors, difficulty with heel walking, decreased sensation at right L5 dermatome, and she had a positive straight leg raise test on the right. So the x-rays, which I'll show in just a bit, she had a grade one L5-S1 isthmic spondylolisthesis, mild right apex degenerative scoliosis, which really interesting what happens after surgery. She had advanced L3-4 disc degeneration, and her MRI shows bilateral right grade and left foraminal stenosis, and near com complete collapse of the L3-4 disc. And this is what it looked like. So there was kind of a mild, you know, degenerative scoli, um, and then also a L5-S1 uh, spondylolisthesis, and uh, loss of normal lordosis. And so this is what it looked like on flexion extension. Not a whole ton of, of motion, but there is a little bit of motion occurring through there. And then this is what her MRI looked like. So she did... She did have some stenosis, I would say maybe moderate, maybe mild to moderate at L3-4, but it was really the right-sided foraminal stenosis from this, from this slip at L5-S1 on the right. That's what was really giving her the reticulopathy. And so she had lateral recess as well as foraminal stenosis. And so her diagnosis is grade one L5-S1 spondylolisthesis. She has a mild lumbar degenerative scoliosis and some moderate L3-4 stenosis. So the question for the surgeons is what would you do? Here are the choices. 
open L3-4 and L5-S1 laminectomies. Number two, open L1 through S1 posterior spinal fusion. Number three, open L1 through S1 anterior posterior spinal fusion. Number four, MIS L3-4 and L5-S1 decompressions. Number five, MIS L1 through L5 lateral lumbar interbody fusions and posterior spinal fusion. And number six, MIS right L5-S1 T-lifts. So show of hands, who would do number one? Open Lammies. Okay. Who would do number two? Open L1 through S1 posterior spinal fusion. Number three, who would do open L1 through L S1 anterior posterior fusions? Oh, would you do that? Would you do an L5 S1 decompression? Is that what you do? Open or MIS? Okay. Who would do it? So, so you're the only person that would do an open surgery. That's really interesting. Um, who would do an MIS L3-4 and L5 S1 de decompressions? So you, but that's, that might be you, open slash MIS. Who would do MIS L1 through L5 LF and posterior spinal fusion? And who would do the MIS right L5 S1 T lift? Who would do a mid lift? Okay, so that's what I chose. I chose MIS right L5 S1 T lift. I think she's the ideal um, candidate for this. So these are my operative steps. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm just going to go through probably the TLF. But this is what the patient looked like. I mean, you know, so you tell me, Peter, that you're going to try to do this mi minimally invasive midline approach to this patient through this. So look, you're, you're not a big guy. None of us are big people here. But this is what you'd, you'd be right inside of the wound for a long time, right? You'd be stuck in the wound for a long time. And I don't think this would be an open procedure. I mean, I, I, sorry, it would not be a minimally invasive procedure. It would be an open procedure. And this is why. Because when you have sort of like a normal size, normal girth person, this is the amount of skin incision you need to, in order to actually get down to the spine, even for the midlift, right? But just imagine this. Just imagine if the patient is much larger with a much larger BMI, like this patient, and you can't do MIS surgery on her through that midline approach to try to get down in there. Because in order to, do, to get down to that same area of spine, you have to make a much larger incision, even with a midlift approach. So you'd be stuck right inside of the, her, her body for a long time. And it would, not, it would convert from a mini open to an open procedure. So this endoscopic assisted TLIF, a, a lot of Korean surgeons are really looking at this right now as well. And I've played around with it, you know, using a tube and then putting a scope in there. And you see a little annulotomy by putting a little scope in there. And this is what you see. Initially, you see a snowstorm. It's all disc material. Then when you start cleaning out with pituitary, RF ablation, and subtotal discectomy, this is, then it starts looking more familiar, right? You can see the L5 superior end plate. You can see the contralateral annulus. And this is before, like, we're all guessing. Let's just be honest here. Open or MIS TLIF, we're guessing about the, the amount of inner body discectomy as well as end plate preparation we're really doing. But we really don't know. But when you put a scope in there, we can be, I agree, we can be like our sports medicine colleagues. We can put shavers in there. We can do curettes. You can put whatever you want in there. And then you start seeing some real anatomy. And, and you can really confirm that you did a, a very good job of the discectomy and end plate preparation. Then you can bone graft through a very small incision through, through these um, funnels now. So you can see, it's like impaction grafting. Our total hip surgeons, when they do acetabular, they, they put impaction grafting. What they do is they, they, they oversize the cup, and then they put graft in there for, for defects. And this is a very effective technique. So you can kind of do the same thing. You can put bone in, into that anterior space. And then you can put whatever you want. So this is a static cage, what we talked about, right? But the problem is the static cages, they're always so small, right? Because in order to, when you go through the TLIF approach, you, the larger the cage is, the, the more likelihood that you're, you're going to injure the exiting or the traversing nerve roots. That's just, that's just the truth. So the cage implantation, you might be able to put it in there, but it really doesn't do much apart from that. So this is what the cage looks like once it's actually implanted. But there are new technologies coming out. And we, I, I love that, that debate between the expandable versus non-expandable. We're only at the very beginning stages of this. So this, is what, this. These are the types of cages that are now coming out. So now, not only can you have width expansion, but now you can have height expansion. So now the, 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 you can have locking mechanisms. And that, the problems with those FDA cages that got pulled from the market 
It was because of these locking mechanisms. But now we have mechanisms that are also dual locking. You can lock it here. And there's a final way of actually putting in a set screw, very much like what you do with ACDFs, right? All the screws have a locking mechanism at the very, at the very end with different lower doses. And then this is what you can do. So this is like building a ship in a bottle. You make a small incision and you, you expand this so you have this optimized fit. And the footprint then is much more like an A-lift cage or a, an L-lift or an X-lift cage rather than a T-lift cage. So this is some video, not, not from me, but essentially now you can do this entire procedure, the T-lift portion of it through one device, okay? So you can make a small incision, go into the disk space with one device, expand this in, in both planes, not only cranial caudal but medial lateral, and then you can pack it with bone through that exact same instrument. And that's, the, that's a picture of the implant. So now, talking about the fusion rates, right? Well, this, now this allows you to then place whatever biologic you want within the same incision, as well as dual lock it at the final stage. And, and I think, again, these are emerging technologies that are coming out that I think are solving the problems of the early designs of the expandable cages. And this is, this is one of the amazing things about um, this, this approach is that you can now pack in like 10, 15 cc's of biologics into the space. And just think about the expandable cages because, you know, Stephen, you did a really nice job of talking about the negative aspects of expandable cages. But you remember when, like, when we used to do our own work on, with cars, you have a car jack, you jack it up, right? But then you're always afraid the car's going to come down on your face because it's, the footprint is very narrow. And so just, that's how expandable cages are today. It's just like car jack, you jack it up, and then, of course, it's going to subside because that's very small, like, point of contact, only two points of contact. But if we have larger points of contact, four points of contact, and then spread out the surface area, and then pack everything with bone, it's going to fuse better, and it's going to be much more stable. So finally, pedicle screw instrumentation, we do this percutaneously either by hand, or more recently with power. So this is really like, this is another thing where once you go po powered screws, you never go back because it's, it's just an amazing technology. And people in construction are using powered technology. You very rarely ever see construction people using like hand-powered screws now. And through these incisions, you, you insert the rod. And then now you either have rod persuaders or you have, you have tabs that, that reduce the spondylolisthesis. And that one case of that grade two spondylolisthesis that, that Chol did, two level, right? Or, I'm sorry, the, the grade two re reduction, you can now reduce these using percutaneous techniques, which I think is really f phenomenal. You can directly visualize the screws, the rods, and you can even actually take out hardware now percutaneously. So you end up with small incisions, and you don't have to make a large incision in this, in this patient. So this is, this is her case. So, so perioperatively, um, there was five, 50 cc's of blood loss. The surgical time was two hours and five minutes, and the length of hospitalization was two days. And um, this is what, what it looked like just immediate post-op. But this is kind of an interesting thing. So she had a 20 degree lordosis. We did the surgery and then three, uh, three month and six month, her 20 degree scoliosis, it went away. And so it, it was really, we, th we thought this was very interesting. It was probably because of the fact that she had rid radiculopathy. And so she, she had this sort of structural scoliosis that corrected itself once her radiculopathy was, was addressed. So her clinical outcome w went from seven to zero, VAS in the back, seven to zero in her, in her right leg. Her ODI went from 56 to zero. And we, we presented this uh, a while back at IMAST, an estimated blood loss, 189 for MIS, 482 for open, zero tr transfusions for MIS group versus f almost 50% in the, in the open group. Hospital days, 2.7 versus 5.1, so half the hospitalization days. Complications, there were two incidental derotomies in the MIS group. Very happy customer, and she was very, very happy with her results, with small incisions. So in summary, MIST lifts can be performed with similar, if not superior. I would, make, I would have never made that statement maybe five years ago. I think these results are now superior. I really do. Compared to the open um, T lifts, and including the, the mid lift. I think the mid lift is a great approach, but it, I, I kind of consider it to be, it's, it's like sort of that transition from open to, to mini open to, to 
true percutaneous, there's definitely a steep learning curve, and you've heard that already, but you have to keep on going from that pathway from open to mini open to MIS two base, and we have to learn the UBE best technique. We have to do it. I think we, we hear the, the members of CAS should be the leaders in the United States of UBE and BEST. I really do believe that. MIS T-lifts are rapidly becoming the standard of care. Um, if, you're, if you're available in two weeks at the Seattle Science Foundation, you're all welcome to come um, to uh, the annual MIS symposium that we host. Um, it's been, it's, a, it's the fifth annual here, but we've been running a similar course like this for the last decade. So you're all invited to come to our course in two weeks. Thank you very much.